All right. Good morning, church. Now, let me step it up from the pastor's <laughs> position. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's such a wonderful day to be at church, to worship, to declare our faith in Jesus Christ, to be able to say, I believe in you. That's a, such a declaration of faith, to say that we believe in him because he is the God of miracles. Hallelujah. So this morning, you're welcome. And, uh, you know, this uh, June, we are dealing with the series, The Basics. And I think that, Pastor, you knocked it out of the ballpark, they say, last week when you talked about the basics. You know, this is a football. I, I feel like saying to you this morning, this is Sunday. This is resurrection morning. This is the day we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead to give us hope and to give us life. The basics. Now, talking about the basics, I remember when I made my entrance into my very first physics class in middle school. You know, first physics class. Now, now for some of you, you are already chuckling because you ran out of the, that class. Uh, but sadly for you this morning, I'm going to remind you of it. Um, I know, and, and so let me give a disclaimer that if it's, after this, we need counseling about, you know, uh, maybe we would ask for some people to help. <laughs> However, I really loved my physics teacher because he was so passionate about the subject of physics that it just stuck with me. There was just something about him. So, and many, if we, if we are really honest, sometimes we give our teachers very little credit. Uh, sometimes we need to give them more credit because they, they, they labor hard to make us, you know, love something that for the most of us, we don't really want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> come on, can we just give a round of applause to teachers? Come on, come on, come on, guys. So after he introduced as to the subject of physics. So he told us about the definition of physics, what physics is all about. Um, I remember how he would, you know, uh, when we had our, when we, had, when we were preparing for our very first test in, in, uh, in physics, and then we would be asking, you know, like middle school kids, they want to know what will come in the test before it comes. <laughs> and so we're asking, like, what will be on the test, sir? What will be on the test? And then he would just say, he would just go like, what is a force? And uh, the, 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 then the unfortunate thing is, I remember we asked him the first time and says, what is a force? So I went through my notes. I did not see any topic called what is a force. Because I was waiting, because, you know, you used to give us notes. So I was waiting to just go to a, a section that is titled, what is a force? So I, I got frustrated. I came back to him again. I said, but what is going to be on the test? Again, he repeated the same thing. What is a force? And then when I started reading my notes even closer, I noticed that there was a definition of a force inside of my notes. And so uh, when I was looking at it, he said, and I will never forget because it made me to read the force several times. So he says, it is that thing mentioned in the law of inertia that starts a body moving or slows down a body or stops it or changes the direction of the motion of an object. Now, I can remember this, and this was 32 years ago. <laughs> now, that's how good my teacher was. Come on, can you give a round of applause to my teacher? <laughs> Talking about basics and how they can stick with us even throughout life. But there was something that my teacher taught me that in retrospect, I saw that, you know, I saw the significance of what he taught us. He taught us about the laws of motion. So the one law that he taught us was the, you know, the first law of motion, and which says that an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion, with the same speed and in the same direction, unless acted upon by an on 
balanced force. An object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion unless something happens. You know all truth is parallel? All truth is parallel. Now, whatever happens in the natural realm is what really happens in, even in the spiritual realm. Now, I remember sometimes Jesus was rebuking the people of his day. Uh, and he did that in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. He was rebuking them for, under, for having the, the understanding of what goes on naturally, but claiming not to have an understanding and not having a discernment of what goes on in the spiritual. This is what he said to them. He said, when you, when you see the cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain. And it does. And when you, when you see the south wind blowing, he says, you say, it's going to be hot, like yesterday, and it is. Then Jesus rebuked them. He says, hypocrites. He says, you know to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret the present time? So Jesus was telling them, that the physical environment where we live is a pointer to a greater truth in the spiritual. How many of us know that the physical world that we have here was birthed from a spiritual world? How many of us know that what we now see today came from something we do not see? How many of us know that the sounds we hear today came from something that had no sound? So, when we understand, when we look at our physical world, it is a representation of what happens even in the spiritual. Now, let me go back again to my Newton's first law of motion. It says, a resting object will stay at rest. And a moving object will keep on moving unless something happens. How true is it about our lives? A life head, headed in a particular direction will keep on in that direction. A marriage headed in a particular path will keep on on that path unless something happens. A community headed in a direction will keep on on that direction unless something happens. A nation headed in a particular direction will keep on, on in that direction unless something happens. You know, this morning, we are talking about make a difference. And, yet, and last week, Pastor dealt with the subject of staying engaged when he, when he spoke with us. But you know, the Bible asserts that none of us is heading naturally to a right direction. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the Bible tells us very clearly, and, and your wife and your, your spouse knows it even better than I do, that you are not really, really um, the wonderful man and the wonderful woman that we think you are. But I'm just speaking to myself, you know, I'm just speaking to myself. You guys look very holy and very nice this morning. But the truth is that all of mankind is headed for the wrong direction. And that is why it became necessary for God to intervene. So all of us are bound to continue down that path of destruction. All of our children are bound to continue in that path of destruction. All of our communities and our nation is, con is bound to continue on that path of destruction unless something happens. But well, that is why Jesus came. When Jesus came to the earth, he came to do something. He came to reverse what was like our usual path. He came to bring us back to the path. He came like a force. <laughs> like my physics teacher said, he came like that unbalanced force, that force that was contrary to our own, you know, uh, 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 our, the, the path that we are taking, the direction that you and me were taking as human beings. He came to be the one that will save our lives. So he came and he got 
are saved. For every one of us that is saved, for everyone that has given his life to Jesus, for everyone here that has, has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their personal Savior, for any of us here that has surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, a pattern in our life was interrupted. We all were interrupted. If you say you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, your life was interrupted. Something happened. An unbalanced force was introduced in your life. And that force today pushes you in a different direction. And that force today pushes you in the right direction. Our life would no longer stay the sa- on the same path because of this introduction of this very uh, uh, special force, the very force of salvation the very force of Jesus Christ in our lives. Our lives will no longer be on the same path again. Why? Because Jesus came. But you know, Jesus did not just come to interrupt our path, to set us on a different new journey. He came so that with him in our lives, we will also be pattern interrupters in other people's lives. Now now that you did not hear me, you just got up from sleep. Let me repeat it again. I said that when Jesus came into your life and my life, he did not just come to interrupt the pattern that was going on in our life. He came so that you and me will be recruited to become men and women that interrupt patterns in other people's lives. That sounds better now. We, were, we are called to be world changers. We are called to be difference makers. We are called to make a difference wherever we are, whether in the school system, whether at Walmart or wherever we work, on the street corners, wherever you work and where, wherever you dwell, we were called to be difference makers. You know, this morning I would take an example of a difference maker, uh, and, and, and it happens to be a woman um, And I want us to just look at her life and just get some lessons about what being a difference maker is all about. And I'm reading today from the book of Judges, and I'm reading from chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8. Now, this is what it says. In the days of Shemgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the the main ways were deserted because travelers kept to the side roads. Villages were deserted. They were deserted in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. Israel chose new gods. Then war was in their gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. So this is a story about the woman, the lady Deborah. Um, we are told that she's actually, she was actually a prophetess. And the Bible says that the roads were deserted, things were not moving, nothing was going on in Israel until a woman arose and decided to become a mother of Israel. Here is a woman who decided, I am going to mother this nation. This nation seems to be motherless. They don't have direction. They don't have anyone telling them what to do and how to do it, I am going to be a mother of a nation. What audacity. Now, when you understand within the context and the culture of the day that women were not even counted in a census, that women were not considered equal to men in any way, that they were not even considered as human beings because they were not even count them, right? They would just count the men. And not every man even, they would count the, the, the men that were kind of majority age. <laughs> but here is a woman who believed that she could make a difference. And Bible says she arose to become a mother of an entire nation. What an audacious move, I would say. So I am going to be talking this morning about three things that difference makers do differently from the rest of us? What are some of the things that difference makers do that make, causes them to make the difference that they do? 
Why is it that difference makers have a different mentality? What is, the, what is going on in their brain? What, how do they look at life differently from the rest of us? Number one, difference makers arise. Let me read that passage again. And this time around, I will read it from a different version. I will read it from the NIV version. This is what the Bible says from, you know, Judges 5 from verse 6. It says, in the days of Shemgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. It says the highways were abandoned. There was war in the land. Nobody, nobody had the courage to go on the highways. People took to winding paths, the Bible says. Verse 7, villagers in Israel would not fight. The enemy was so powerful. The people had lost, you know, the courage to fight. They had lost the courage to, to wrestle for their own nation. The Bible says villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. Difference makers arise. Difference makers arise. Difference makers arise. If you would have to be a difference maker, you would have to make up your mind that you are going to do things differently. You are going to stand up. You are going to arise. You are not going to follow in the path that is popular. You are going to choose a path that is a little bit outside of the ordinary. Every difference maker's life begins with a great realization that things cannot stay the same. Every difference maker's life begins with an understanding that I have to interrupt the pattern. Have you ever looked at your life and said, there is this thing about Madison that needs to be dealt with? Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and you said, there is this thing about this man that needs to be adjusted? Have you ever looked at your family and said, there is this thing in this family that needs an intervention? Have you ever looked at your community and you said, there is this thing in my community, in my nation, that needs to be addressed? Truth is, many of us have had that encounter. But did, did we arise to do something about it? Mm, not quite. We're waiting for somebody to do it. But difference makers arise. They understand that the change must that change must happen. They understand that the pattern must be interrupted. They understand that life must become more intentional. Life must become more intentional. You know, six years ago, as I was approaching the age of 40, I decided that the hallmark in my next 40 years, if God would permit me to be here, is that I would become intentional about my life. I decided that I would make my life count. I decided that I would make my life become significant. And I, know, I remember that around about this time was a very difficult time in my life. And I was going through a lot of challenges with myself, with my, you know, uh, you know, in my family situation at that time. And I remember that when I read Psalm 78. And when I read Psalm 78, I knew for sure that this is something that God was calling me as a person to. Now, this is what Psalm, Psalm 78 says from verse 70. It says, it's talking about the man David, the, no, the King David. It says, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought him to, the, to be shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. He led them. When I read this passage, I understood that God truly wanted me to be someone that would rise up to be a shepherd of his people. And I knew that shepherding and leading and leadership would not just be something that I do in the church circles, but it's something that I would do both in the church and outside of the church because your mission is your mission. Your mission, in fact, none of us really has a mission to the church. Most of the mission that we have is to the people that are outside of the four walls of the church. We come to church for training. 
Church is a military camp. That is where we learn, the, we learn the drills. That is when we learn how to operate. And when we go out, then we carry out the real mission. I remember a couple of years ago when we had just come here, Madison was very young and we used to put him in the daycare center. And uh, we used to put him uh, at the, the daycare center at the Lutheran, at the, Lutheran uh, the Redeemer Church. Uh, Lutheran Church. And uh, one of the things, uh, when I used to drive in and drop him off, they had one in- interesting sign. And I hope that everybody saw that sign and understood what that sign means. When you are driving out of the church campus, there is a sign that says, your mission world begins, something like that. No, now you are entering the mission field. Yes, you are now entering the mission field. I thought that was the most wonderful billboard I've ever seen in all of my life. It says you are now entering the mission field. I mean, I think... That is not supposed just to be a, something that we post to look good as a church or something. It's supposed to really be what the church is about. So when you and me leave this, the, you know, this premise or these premises this morning, we have to leave this place with the understanding that we are entering into what it is truly our mission field. That when you go into that school system that you just entered You just went on your pulpit right there. That you just assumed responsibility. That you just checked in. That you just clocked in to work. Because that is what counts before the eyes of God. And so, when I was going to this, I I, I could tell, I could feel in my heart that the Lord wanted me to arise from just tending the sheep. Now, the reason why this particular passage made a lot of meaning for me is because I'm a village boy. I actually grew up in a little village in Africa. And my grand, I grew up, with my, grew up with my grandfather and my grandmother. So my grandfather had sheep, and I used to be the sheep boy, you know? So I used to take care of the sheep. Every morning I would go to the hills, because then you, you, know, you didn't have them around the, the home. So I would go up to the hills when there, is, when there is dew on the grass, and I remember every morning I would take a stick and so I basically beat my way through the path up into the hills, and then I would lose, I would untether the goats and then take them to to where they have to have pasture, and then I would, you know, there we would, you know, we use a stake in the ground so that they are attached so they don't go wild and do all of that. And that was my, you know, that was one of my morning chores before I went to school every day. And so today, and I look at my kids, and they are like, (laughs) just to get up and take a shower, it seems like a lot of work to do. (laughs) And all the parents said, You know, and, 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 and so when I, I read on this passage and, 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 and the Bible says, David, God said, I took you from taking care of the sheep. And I remembered how I used to take care of my grandfather's goats. And I said, Lord, yeah, that's true. It says, he took him from the sheep that he would be a shepherd of his people, Israel. Of his, the people of his inheritance. The people that are meant to inherit the promise of God. And the Bible says that when he called David to such a great task, it is said that David rose up and shepherded the people. The Bible says with two characteristics, with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. And I said to myself, oh Lord, grant me the grace that for the rest of the 40 years, if God, you know, I was was turning 40, so I said, grant me that for the rest of the 40 years that I now have, if you would permit me be here, but that I want to be able to shepherd your people, to lead them, to understand that it is something that we can all do, that we can be people that have an integrity of heart and we will train them with the skills that they need to lead their own lives, to lead their families, to lead their careers, to lead their nations, to lead their communities as God will have them do it. And that became my commitment. And that's really what got me into starting a ministry all together and starting an organization all together. For the rest of you that are here and that know me, you know that I lead, lead Missions International. Now, this is one of the things that really happened to me. I said, Lord God, we are going to train leaders, people around the world that will understand that they have to take leadership in their lives. You know, to do so with integrity of heart, to do so with skillful hands. So Jesus became my great, my, my great model for this. Because he said, I am the great shepherd. Say, and he says, the good shepherd lays down his life 
for the sheep. And so we are called, so I believe that we are called to lead, and I believe that I in particular am called to raise up leaders. And that is when, it was at this time, that I decided to write what I call the legacy statement for my life. I said, Lord, now, from now on, and for the, as long as I live, I will be committed to this. I want to be remembered as a man who loved his wife as Christ loved the church. I want to be known as a father who raised his children in the way they should go. I said, I want to be known as a citizen who served his native land, Cameroon. That's why we're going to Cameroon in a few days. I want to be known as a man who helped men and women around the world discover, pursue, and fulfill their God-given purpose. That is what I want to be measured for. That is what I want, because that is what I believe that God was calling me to. And I said to myself, this is what I want to arise and to be and to do in my own life. Now let me ask you a question. What is it that God is calling you to arise to? What is it that he is putting on your heart? What is that burden that he is placing on your heart? Will you arise to take hold of the thing that God is calling you to? But not only difference makers arise, number two, difference makers take responsibility. Now look at Judges again. In verse 7 it is said, villages in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose I arose a mother in Israel. It is said, villagers in Israel would not fight until Deborah arose. I find this statement very interesting and very intriguing. Villagers in Israel would not fight. In other words, villagers would not take responsibility. They're waiting for someone else to fight and deliver them. They're waiting for someone else to take care of business. No one was fighting for their children. No one was fighting for their marriages. No one was fighting for their community. No one was fighting for their nation until Deborah arose and took responsibility and said, if no one wants to take care of this entire nation, one woman stood up and said, I will be a mother of an entire nation. For me, that is taking responsibility. She took the responsibility to bring Israel back to what Israel ought to be. Now here's my question to you. When shall you take responsibility for what is going on in your life? When shall you take responsibility for what is going on in your family? When shall you take responsibility for what is going on in our community and in our nation? You know, probably America is the most divided nation in this time and, and, and season like we have never, never known. What, are we, what is going to be our role? Are we going to be part of the division? Are we going to be part of the unity on bringing our nation together? What, what, what part are we going to really play in all what is happening? You and me are called to responsibility. Now the truth is that every one of us has a responsibility, a role to play in what is going on. Can it be, could it be that you are just one responsibility away from being a difference maker? Someone here is just one responsibility away from being a difference maker. If you would just arise, and maybe you don't feel like it, maybe you, you don't feel like you are qualified to be it, man, how do you expect a village boy from Africa and God says, you know, you are going to raise leaders all over the world, you are going to speak to leaders and, and kings and presidents and all of that. How do you expect me to believe that? But we can do so because we understand that he is a God who makes the impossible to be possible. We just sang the song, we said, he makes the impossible to be possible. We can believe him, we can trust him, that every, for whatever he has called us, he will cause it and to, bring, to come to pass. So let us take responsibility for the things that God is nudging us on our hearts to do. Take responsibility. It might be to your family. It might be to your personal life. It might be in your community. Take responsibility. Decide you are going to do something. Arise and take responsibility. But not only are we to arise, not only do difference makers take responsibility. Lastly, difference makers make a contribution. They don't just take responsibility, but they make their contribution. Again, think about it. In a day and age when 
Women were not even counted. In a day and age when women did not go to war, Deborah arose and led an entire army, so to speak. Now, listen to the comment of the, the general of the army of Israel, what he said. The general of the army of Israel in Judges 4, 8 said this. To, and, he, and, and, he's, and the general said this to Deborah, by the way. He said to Deborah, if you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. He was unwilling to go and fight. Can you imagine that the U.S. armies, we are, face, we are facing, a, we are facing a, an attack as a nation? And all of the guys who are in command say, we are not going until a certain woman tells us to go. And the woman is not a president. He's not like, so don't, 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 don't mess it up. It's not the Congress. It's not the Senate. It's not anything. But a woman took responsibility and an entire army of an entire nation said, we are not going anywhere until she tells us to go. Now, that tells me something. When God gives you responsibility, when God lays something on your heart, you might think you are the, the stupidest, smallest person, the most ignored person, the one that comes from the UP, the place that is forgotten, the place that has been given over to Wisconsin, something that they belong to Wisconsin. You might feel like that, but God doesn't feel like that. When you arise, you will be recognized. When you arise, the people to whom you have been called will, will know that you are their leader. They will understand that you are a, the person that should come and do this thing. But we must come to a place where you and me realize that we are the ones that God is looking for. We are the ones that God is waiting for. And through her, Israel defeated its enemy. Israel defeated the enemy. And she became one of the judges of Israel, which is a very rare thing in that culture and in that time. Now, can you just, just think about this? Just think about this. You know, we as America pride ourselves as a nation that is free, you know, and a nation where anybody can become anything. But since the foundation of our nation till today, there's never been a female president. But here is a nation that they will not even count women, but a woman believed God enough to put an entire nation under her control. And the nation would not do anything on, unless she would give, give her go, her go ahead. She was the one giving the marching orders to the army. But it never would have happened if she did not do what we just told you. She arose. She took responsibility over the nation. She gave her contribution. And Israel became a victorious nation. And Israel came out of their predicaments. You know, in less than three weeks, you know, I shall be leading a team of 16 to Cameroon. We have 13 leaving from the U.S., one from Mexico, one from the U.K., and one from Egypt. And we, shall, we have six planned events. We will be having our men lead conference, which will be our first time we're organizing an all men's leadership conference, just to talk about male leadership. We shall be organizing what we call the leading lady conference, which is, which is a conference just for women to, 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 to uh, make, cause women to embrace uh, leadership as females and decide to be like Deborah and arise and make a difference in the nation. We are also organizing what we call our New Hope, uh, New Hope Live Worship Concert. We are actually taking a team of a, a band, a, a worship band from Texas, from out of Texas, a band of seven people and taking them to Cameroon. We want to be able to worship God over the land. And we, have, we want to be able to, to, to pray for the land of Cameroon. We want to pr really pray for the country. And so that God can have his way. We'll also be meeting with the prime minister of the nation. We'll be talking to, uh, we'll, we'll be doing what we call the take the lead conferences in over seven churches in our capital city in, of that nation. We'll also be doing an, an orphanage visit. Overall, we'll be reaching to no less than 4,000 people during our trip there. I want you to pray for us. We just, want, we, we just want to give our own little contribution. We just want to be able to make a difference, even if that difference is a dent. Um, have you ever, has any of you ever had a dent in your car? How did you feel? 
Though it's just a small scratch, every day it reminds you that you bought that car with some precious, your precious money. So, you can make a difference. Even if that difference is just a scratch. Even if that difference is just a tiny thing. We have been called to make a difference. So arise, take responsibility, and make your contribution. If you feel this morning, I, I came this morning and I really wanted to pray with someone who feels like this is the time. Uh, you might not know exactly how it is going to be like. You might not know what kind of contribution you want to make. But you know, you sense in your heart that this is the time to make a difference. In your life, in your family, in your community, in this church. Now, I want to be able to pray for you. You might be here in the sanctuary or you might be in the hub. But if you feel like this is the time, I think I ought to be doing something. Even if you don't know it, you can say, God, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I will never forget this story about a lady who became known as the cake evangelist, who got saved at a very, as a senior. And she said, Lord God, I am an old woman. What can I do for you? And the Lord asked him a question. It's a very interesting story. What can you do? And she said, I can bake a cake. Now, that doesn't seem like a formula for transforming the world, does it? I mean, like baking a cake. And what the Lord said, yeah, that's, what, that's all I need you to do. And she was like, what, what does that mean? And then, so the Lord said, go and bake a cake. And she baked a cake. And the Lord said, go, to, go give it to your neighbor. And she went, knocked the door of the neighbor, gave the cake to the neighbor. And the neighbor received the cake. Well, I was very surprised. Like, I don't know what, not knowing what to make of that. And then she just said, well, Jesus told me to give this to you. Oh, the neighbor said, okay, awkward, but okay. Next day he said, well, make another cake. She made another cake and said, go to the other neighbor. One neighbor after the other, she began to do that. And she would say, Jesus told me to bake a cake for you. Now, a few months later, neighbor after neighbor came to her home and said, what did you mean by the statement, Jesus told you to give me a cake? And as she began to explain to them who Jesus is, one after the other, they began to turn their lives to Jesus Christ. Before the, what, you know, before the cake evangelist, as she became known, before she passed away, she was leading thousands to Christ every year through her cake ministry. So you might say to yourself, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I, I, am, I don't preach, I don't do so, all of that stuff. That's for Pastor Kevin and the others. Uh, but you can make a difference. And if you are feeling this morning like God is calling you to make a difference, why not just walk to the front? You might be in the hub. Come on, walk. I just want to pray with you. I just want to ask that God, will, that God will start a move in our lives.